Hello, and welcome to Gairdner Science Week 2021. I'm Janet Rossent, and I'm President and Scientific Director of the Gairdner Foundation. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Gairdner Foundation is located in Toronto, Canada, and we acknowledge we're on the traditional territory of many nations, including the sagas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Sony, and the Wendat peoples. And today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. The Canada Gairdner Awards celebrate scientific excellence worldwide. More than 395 awards have been presented around the globe, and 97 of those awardees have gone on to receive the Nobel Prize. Through recognizing excellence and hosting events like these, Gairdner aims to inspire the next generation of scientists and innovators and engage the Canadian public in the excitement of scientific research. Today's public lecture is Genetics as a Way of Thinking with one of our 2021 Canada Gairdner International Award laureates, Dr. Mary Claire King. Dr. King is a pioneer. Dr. King is a pioneer in human genetics and its application to understanding cancer origins. With her discovery of the BRCA1 gene, mutations in which cause inherited predisposition to breast and ovarian cancer but she is recognized also worldwide for her humanitarian work using DNA analysis to trace origins in different human rights cases. And we all look forward to hearing her stories. So today's event wouldn't be possible without our committed partners and sponsors. And I'd like to thank our Gold Gardner Week sponsors, the University Health Network, York University, the University of Toronto, Sinai Health, Queen's University and McGill University. I'd also like to thank our partners, the Government of Canada, Alberta and Quebec, CIHR, and our media partners, the Globe and Mail. And you can learn all about our sponsors by visit visiting the Expo booth, which is located on the left-hand side of your screen. So after her lecture, Dr. King will be available to answer questions. So please be sure as you're watching the lecture to put your questions in the chat box on, on the right-hand side of your screen anytime during the lecture. So, here we go. Welcome, Dr. King. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, Janet. It's a tremendous pleasure to be, to be in Canada with you, if only virtually. It was also a great pleasure to have a conversation with you this morning that our audience has heard. It's an honor to be allowed as, as this first seminar speaker to amplify a bit on some of the things that we that we started to talk about this morning under the theme of genetics is a way of thinking and genomics is a set of tools. I think of these, of these two fabulous fields in balance. For as long as people have been asking questions, they have been asking questions that are fundamentally genetics questions. But just in our generation, do we now have the really splendid genomics tools to answer them? Another way that I think about this is that nowadays, Geneticists have beautiful instruments, genomic instruments, and we go wherever people want us to sing. So this little talk will be the songs from one minstrel. The themes that will, that will thread their way, that will braid their way through this talk are shown here. Discovery, gene discovery, discovery of new approaches, discovery of, of new relationships between genes and phenotypes. Precision medicine, public health, identity, and development, that is biological development as revealed by genes. The first theme, the first, uh, the first vignette I'd like to touch on is one that is the subject of several talks of mine during this week, so I will truly only touch on this, and that is the genetics of inherited breast and ovarian cancer. As we discussed this morning, Janet and I, my life for the last 40 some years has been very largely devoted to this idea. And this is one family that if you follow my talks through this week, you will see again. This is a family in which breast cancer represented by dark circles, for example, here and here, and ovarian cancer represented, for example, by this dark circle here, has been inherited in many generations of this very severely affected family. In this and all the pedigrees I'll show for the next few minutes, Circles are represented by women, or represent women. Squares represent men. 
people in a row are siblings of each other or are married, represented by a small line, to a person who is a sibling of others in the same row. A fully filled circle or square represents the condition that we are concerned about, and a partially filled circle or square represents a related condition. A line through a symbol represents a person who has died. So the meaning of this pedigree is that breast cancer has been inherited in this family through multiple generations. We'll hear much more about that in the week to come in all of my conversations and talks. It was clear as, as after BRCA1 was mapped by my group and cloned by, by others, uh, it became clear with a lot of additional work that the risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer among a woman who carry, among women who carry a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, even if they are not in a severely affected family like this, for any woman who carries a mutation in BRCA1 or its sister gene BRCA2 is extremely high. And the availability now of very modern genomic technology so that every every young adult can determine if they carry a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 has really changed the landscape of what we can hope to prevent for breast and ovarian cancer. So we'll hear much more about that later in the week. The next vignette I'd like to discuss in a little more detail is the story that Janet and I touched on this morning. That is the story of using genomic DNA sequencing to identify the missing children of Argentina. I was approached by the Abuelos of Plaza de Mayo. This is a group of grandmothers in Buenos Aires who were in the 1980s, in 1983. These, these grandmothers were attempting to, to find children who had been kidnapped by the military dictatorship during the dirty war in Argentina of 1975 to 1983 and had been put into the hands by and large of militaries or of collaborationists, often mafiosi, who had collaborated with the militaries. And the grandmothers were, as this poster says, we are searching for two generations. Their question to me was, if we can identify a child that we believe might be one of our grandchildren in the hands of a military couple, with the understanding that this child's parents, namely our adult children, have disappeared and been murdered. Can you, as a geneticist, prove whether this child is or is not the child for whom we are searching? So I didn't know immediately how we were going to do this, but I knew that in principle I could, and we did. The most powerful technology that we used was sequencing mitochondrial DNA. That's shown here. The mitochondrial DNA is a loop of 16,000 plus base pairs. This origin of replication region at the top of this loop is, is several hundred base pairs long. It does not encode any genes. Consequently, it can absorb a great deal of variation by mutation over time throughout mammalian evolution. Mitochondrial DNA is completely maternally transmitted. That is, it is transmitted in the egg. Although sperm have mitochondrial DNA, they do not transmit it to offspring. So that means that any person, a boy or a girl, has the same mitochondrial DNA as his or her mother, maternal uncles and aunts, maternal grandmothers, and the siblings of maternal grandmothers, and so on. Everyone shown in red on this slide whereas the people shown in green or shown in blue have different mitochondrial DNA inherited from their mothers. This was already known when I began to work with the grandmothers, and we began to collect DNA from grandparents who were searching for their missing grandchildren, that is, women in this situation or uncles and aunts of missing children, and as the grandmothers identified children that were being held in various wide variety of situations that they thought might be their grandchildren, we would obtain court orders to sequence DNA taken from small blood sample from the child that was a putative relative of the family and from one of or one or more of the mitochondrial relatives of this child. And here's what that sequence looked like back in the back in the uh, mid 1980s. It was by hand, and we counted every base pair. 
and this is this is me, a much younger me, working with two of the grandmothers just just to look at the beauty of DNA and see what it could tell us. And here are some of the young people whom we identified. By and large, these children had been held for years, this, this girl for 10 years, this boy for 13 years, this little guy for about uh, three and a half years, in the hands of militaries, but were released in consequence of extraordinary work on the part of the grandmothers, the, the Argentinian legislature, and their uh, allies in the ultimately reformed uh, Argentinian judiciary. These, this pair of girls I mentioned specially because they were, they were taken care of in completely good faith by a family who did not know who they were, but learned that they were kidnapped, that they were kidnapped children. And when, when we discovered who they were, they remained in touch with the family who had cared for them all these years. They took back their original names. They now have children of their own. Everyone involved knows each other and knows the entire story of what happened. Because of the success in reuniting children by the use of mitochondrial DNA, reuniting them with their, with their mitochondrial relatives and, of course, therefore, with all of their, their extended family, we were asked to undertake the same sort of analysis to identify remains, both in Argentina of the young parents, these parents, who had been disappeared and killed and were buried in mass graves, and ultimately on behalf of victims of human rights abuses on five continents. We did so. Uh, this, the, the technology or the approach that we developed to, to um, remove DNA from teeth works just beautifully. One take, thinks of the tooth as a diamond and one cleaves it under sterile conditions and removes the DNA. And a, and a whole tooth is a very good protector of DNA. As we were, as we were carrying out the project, the, some uh, Argentinian artists made a poster for the grandmothers and me, and I love it, and so I put it here. Um, children who were unknown were called Inye Inye for ningun nombre, and what this artist has pointed out is that the ADNA, that is the DNA of a person, is stronger than being unnamed. Let me turn now to a very different sort of project. This is a project that I've been carrying out since the mid-1990s with friends in the Middle East, friends from Palestine, from Israel, throughout the region. And the goal of this project has been to identify the causes of inherited hearing loss in the region. In in any community in which consanguineous marriages are common, that is marriages between people related to each other, typically cousins, mutations that would otherwise be silent, that is, appear as only one copy of the two copies that each person carries of, of any gene, appear, let's see, here's a good example, appear in two copies in a child because each parent carries a copy of that of that mutation. And if this mutation, this V, if this mutation causes a, a condition, that condition will appear. These are, of course, called recessive traits. So in Palestine, hearing loss is, is quite common because of this phenomenon. So in, in partnership with Moeen Kanan at Bethlehem University and Karen Abraham at Tel Aviv University, and a succession of really remarkable graduate students from Palestine, Israel, and the U.S., we were able to identify in 337 different families, 143 different mutations, in 48 different genes. And here is what I think of as the world's most beautiful pie chart of the number of families uh, that are represented by mutations in each of these genes. Quite a large number of these genes we discovered as genes that harbored mutations responsible for hearing loss as a consequence of carrying out the project. Consanguineous marriages are now declining quite rapidly in Palestine, both on the West Bank and in Gaza, as girls are better educated. Uh, girls go out, they meet people other than their cousins, and they marry out. Inherited hearing loss will very likely decline as well. From the point of view of what the world knows about hearing, the Palestinian population has contributed probably more than any other single population because people have been so open 
about letting us work with their children to discover the cause of hearing loss in those children. Obviously, this has implications for the use of hearing aids and ultimately of, of cochlear implants. It's an important principle, an important theme of human genetics, that a gene that is responsible for hearing loss in any one population, for example, cadherin 23 in the Palestinian population, will be responsible if it carries mutations, will be responsible for hearing loss in any population in the world. Different mutations, but the same gene. So all of these genes have been discovered to be responsible for hearing loss in populations other than Palestinians, even though many of them were first discovered there. At the same time that we were carrying out this work, because there were so many students involved in it, we developed a partnership between Palestinian universities, particularly Bethlehem University, Israeli universities, both Tel Aviv University and Hebrew universities, and my lab here in Seattle, Washington, for PhD students to be able to obtain um, their degrees, their dissertation work, based on this and other projects that we undertook in the region. And six Palestinian students, four women and two men, have now obtained their dissertations through this partnership. One of them is Amal Abu Rayan, who is, I hope, watching this program from the other side of my lab. She is now a postdoc in my lab, having obtained her joint PhD from Tel Aviv University in Israel and Bethlehem University in Palestine. Congratulations, Amal. <clears throat> the next story I want to tell you is about the genetics of immune dysregulation in children. So immune dysregulatory conditions are both devastating and incredibly difficult to sort out for, for the pediatrician, in part because they can affect any organ system, anything ranging from hemologic disorders to, to brain disorders to um, to kidney dysfunction, and the symptoms are, are general, they overlap, they're just a bear. And, and many of the underlying um, physiological conditions that pediatricians note when working with these children involve immune dysregulation. Because of the power of genomics, my young colleague, Sarah Baxter, who has both a medical degree and a PhD in immunology, so MD, PhD, and on the faculty here at the University of Washington uh, in pediatrics, was able to sequence the genomes, complete genomes, of hundreds of children who had various forms of immune dysregulation clinically defined and to identify the exact genetic cause of that dysregulation. And as you see from, from this pie chart, an, a, a large number of different genes are involved. The biological functions that those genes play when they are behaving normally is shown here. They are quite varied. Some of the genes are involved in innate immunity. Some of them control features of adaptive immunity, some both, and they're highly variable. And one could not have guessed from the clinical presentation what the underlying gene would be. That's just a feature of immune dysregulation. But the beauty of, of applying genetic diagnosis in this context is that treatments for many of these children, most of them, are now available that can be based on these genetic diagnoses. For example, a, a question that arises immediately for any child with a, immune, a, a severe immune dysregulation is, should we carry out hematopoietic stem cell transplant? And we know enough because of the background research being done into each of these genes, we know enough that for about a third of the children who had genetic diagnoses, we know that the answer is yes. A hematopoietic stem cell transplant could be curative. For another proportion, we know this proportion here. For about 15%, we know that a hematopoietic stem cell transplant would not be curative and it should not be undertaken. Similarly, for most of the children, we know what additional features to screen for. And for a number of these children, those additional features include specific cancers. Mutations in many of these genes, as, as those of you who work in this field will have recognized from my previous slide, um, predispose to childhood cancers. And to be able to detect those early is obviously critical. And we now know which cancers to look for in some of these children. And most, most positively, and, and what shall I say, most really um, an extraordinary benefit to, to us of this is that for many of these genes, they've been well enough studied that 
medications that treat the underlying lesion are already approved. And now that we know what the genetic diagnosis is, the physician can use the already approved medication to treat the child. So this is what precision medicine is supposed to be. It actually works. It works when the genetics can converge with what is known about the, the underlying pathway that in, in which a gene acts with what is known of the underlying developmental physiology of the trait. The next, the next story I want to tell you is related to the previous one. <laughs> As a result of the success that our friends saw that we were having here in Seattle with the immunological dysfunction in, in young children, we were asked by by really an extraordinary neonatologist named Kathy Lepig, who, who works here in Seattle, if we would work with her and her Vietnamese colleagues to identify the genes responsible for a wide variety of congenital disorders, both immunologic, neurologic, and so on, in Vietnamese children. Kathy Lepig, Dr. Ngung, Dr. Ngung and Dr. Ngok have been working together for more than a decade, based in Hanoi, to identify the the genes that underlie severe congenital disorders in Vietnamese children. But with very few exceptions, they had not been able to carry out the exact identification because they didn't have the genomic tools available. So I show you, I show you just one example here of the kind of analysis that, that we've been undertaking together. And we were until COVID going every year to Vietnam and carrying this out. We're now trying to do this um, by Zoom. There's Zoom in Hanoi, just like there is everywhere else. And, and it's, it's working, but it will work much better when um, Dr. Lepig and I can, can go and, and work with, and work with our, our partners directly. So this is the Ngung Ngok family. The parents are healthy. They are not related to, this, to each other. This is not a case of a consanguineous marriage. They have had three children, all affected with a devastating disorder. And this order, disorder has the features that the child is healthy at birth, has normal milestones as an infant, and then a gradual loss of motor development and the cognitive skills that they have developed, increasingly painful muscle contractions, signs of premature aging and early death. One child has already died. And this, this girl is now 15. This girl is now nine. We were able to identify the two mutations responsible for this condition in this family. They're in a gene whose features were already known and in which mutations in other parts of the world had been shown to lead to this, to this same set of devastating symptoms. And in this case, the father carries one mutation, what I've, what I've called the blue variant here, and the mother carries a different mutation, what I've called the red variant here. And it's just extraordinarily bad luck that these two people uh, each carry a devastating mutation in this gene. Of course, they had no way to know that. And by again, extraordinary bad luck. In each of the mother's two pregnancies, two previous pregnancies, the children all inherited both of the devastating mutations. Cells that carry mutations in this gene cannot repair damage to active DNA. And, and that accumulated damage builds and builds and builds with the, with the um, consequences that I've explained. This family has now had a healthy child. And they've had a healthy child because they've been able to undertake pre-implantation diagnosis. What that means is that the mother's gametes, the mother's eggs, and the father's gametes, his sperm, are, are used, are fertilized in vitro, in a dish. Several embryos are grown out to the 16 cell stage. Those embryos are tested for their genetics, for this specific the specific appearance, or more importantly, of course, non-appearance of these mutations. And a 16-cell embryo that has only normal sequences at this gene is implanted in the mother, she carries the pregnancy to term, and all is well. Pre-implantation diagnosis is available in Vietnam. It's been successful in Vietnam. It's been successful with this family. And what, what we can contribute as geneticists is the identification of the critical mutation because of course that's what the obstetrician must know in order to be able to select the embryo that is healthy. Let me tell the last story 
in a little bit more detail. This is the story of the genetics of severe mental illness. This is an area that my group and I have been working on now for a little bit more than a decade. We decided to take it on because it's incredibly difficult and incredibly important. And it goes like this. We began our thinking about schizophrenia, as I said, a little more than a decade ago. And in talking to psychiatrists who care for young adults who've had abrupt psychotic breaks, once, one thing I kept hearing over and over again from these friends was that very often the children or the young adults whom they were treating were having a psychotic break out of the blue. They were in healthy families. There was no sign of birth trauma. There was no sign of, of undue trauma during childhood or adolescence. And yet at the age of 18 or 20, 22, 24, they would have a devastating break and be diagnosed as schizophrenia. And in hearing about this, I thought of Anna Karenina, the, which opens with the line, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And what did that mean? The We developed a hypothesis based both on what I've just told you and on the realization as the result of some very good epidemiolo epidemiologic work done in Scandinavia that young adults who are affected with schizophrenia have far fewer children than people in the population as a whole or than their unaffected siblings. And that deficit in fecundity, it's not a matter of biologically being unable to have children, it's a matter of socially removing oneself so that one, one doesn't have, one, one doesn't marry and have children. The, the deficit is about 80% for young men who are affected and about 60% for young women who are affected. So a person who carries a mutation that is, that has caused their schizophrenia is relatively unlikely to pass it on because they have fewer children than other people. So those two concepts merged in my mind for, for this hypothesis, that schizophrenia is a common disease that genetically might be a large collection of individually rare diseases, that is out of the blue in one family, out of the blue in another family, and so on from the geneticist's perspective that is caused by many different rare mutations, each in a gene critical to the developing brain. And as I've said, these individual mutations don't persist for generations and generations and generations, not like in that first family uh, with a mutation in BRCA1 that I showed right at the beginning of this talk. It's not like that because these young people who are affected with schizophrenia have far fewer children. The mutation might last a generation or so, but it is unlikely to last for multiple generations. And that genetically the illness is highly variable between families. So how might this idea play out in practice? How might we develop a testable hypothesis about this idea? Here's how. Take a look at this small pedigree. The idea here is that a person who develops a psychotic who has a psychotic break and develops schizophrenia does so because they have suffered a de novo mutation, a new mutation, generally in utero. It can, it can have been inherited on chromosome from either the father or the mother, but neither the father nor the mother carries the mutation. The mutation in this hypothesis happened in utero. It didn't have an immediate effect. If it had, there would have been a miscarriage and we wouldn't have a story. But this hypothetical subset of mutations occur in genes that are critical to development of the brain and that show their effects only a couple of decades after birth. In other words, with that psychotic break, with the development of schizophrenia. So the way to test this hypothesis was to evaluate young people who were suffering from schizophrenia in families like this and to compare the de novo mutations that that they have in their genomes. All of us have de novo mutations. There's nothing remarkable about having a de novo mutation. What's remarkable is if it is a devastating mutation in a gene that is critical to the development of brain. This is, was still a hypothesis at the time. But to compare the de novo mutations in young people who are suffering from schizophrenia with the de novo mutations, which will be different, in their unaffected siblings. We did so. And here's the result. 
in 105 families that we evaluated that way, in the affected individuals in in 57 different ones of these, we didn't solve every family, in 57 different ones of these, we found a novo mutation that destroyed the function of a gene critical to brain development. And here are some of those mutations shown on this, on this um, diagram that has every human chromosome, chromosome one through chromosome, where did it go? Where's 22? Chromosome 22 and the X and the Y. Um, that, this was several years ago that, that we demonstrated the, the, uh, the reasonableness of this hypothesis and it's now been um, replicated, oh gosh, probably a dozen times in a whole variety of different settings. So de novo devastating mutations in genes critical to brain development can lead to this devastating disorder. Now, in consequence of, of this work, which was carried out on families from North America, we were asked <laughs> if we would be interested in extending this work to a study in Africa. Uh, this is not because there is more schizophrenia in Africa. There's not. But it's because Africa is unique in another way. And let me tell you about that. So I knew from, from my uh, PhD dissertation work that humans and chimpanzees diverged between five and six million years ago, of course, in Africa. The out of Africa migrations of modern humans began much more recently, only 50 to 100,000 years ago. So what happened in between? So another way of thinking about this is that 99% of our life as a species was spent in Africa. And when people began to leave Africa, it was fairly small numbers of people who left Africa compared to the number who stayed. So that means that the amount of variation in Africa is likely to be vastly greater than the amount of variation in any out of Africa population. That's testable, and here's a test of it. Um, on the, on the x-axis, we have a whole series of different populations from each of major continental groups, and these are indigenous Americans. These are not people who emigrated to America from somewhere else. These are indigenous Americans. And on the y-axis, we have the proportion of base pairs of DNA coding sequence that are heterozygous in people from each population. And as you see, the level of heterozygosity, that is the level of variation, person to person within each of these African populations is significantly greater than in populations of any other continental origin. So we put that idea in practice with our friends in South Africa in a study of schizophrenia in the South African uh, Bantu-speaking Xhosa population, a, a, a very major population throughout both the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Now, I repeat, schizophrenia is not more common in the Xhosa population than elsewhere. Uh, the, the prevalence of schizophrenia is about 1% in every population, but we hypothesize that there might be a greater variation in its genetic causes. And again, to go back to that fundamental theme of human genetics, if we identify a gene that is responsible for a trait in any one person, mutation, different mutations in that gene may be responsible for that trait in anyone, anywhere. That is a gene that is responsible for a human condition in any family, anywhere, is responsible for the biology underlying that condition in every family, everywhere. We are all one, one population. So our hypothesis was, can we identify a, as many different genes as possible, each of which harbors a devastating mutation in a person from the Xhosa population who is affected with schizophrenia as opposed to in controls? And how do these genes converge on pathways that are critical to the function of the brain? So we've been doing that with our friends for about six years now. Here's where we stand now. This, this uh, study is still very much in progress. This is a picture of a synapse. And every gene indicated in this drawing of this synapse carries a devastating mutation, what is called in genetics a loss of function mutation, in a person from this population 
who is suffering from schizophrenia, but does not, but this mut the, the same variation, the same mutation is not present in healthy individuals. And as you see, there's a wide variety of different genes with different biological functions, all working at the synapse that share this property. So let me end with a picture of our team from Cape Town with whom I'm carrying out this project. This is the most joyous project imaginable to, to be undertaking. Uh, a picture of their beautiful country through which, they, through which they trek to identify our participants and to leave you with three thoughts which we have developed together. First, the most important questions come from people on the front lines. Second, the most righteous projects demand the most rigorous science. And third, no question is too big to ask. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk this afternoon and enjoy Gardner Week. I would love to take questions that I hope that Janet will tell me from the chat. I certainly will. So can you just shut down your PowerPoint? So we I can... am shutting down. There Perfect. we go. So we can see me like you at this point. Yes. This will happen in just a moment. It's just taking a, moment. a little while to shut down. There we go. Every yeah. every school teacher on the in the audience knows what we're going through. Okay, I'm here, Janet. Right. Nice, great. That was a great talk. I think you touched on, you know, several sort of vignettes that, that span your career, but also of course span the, the, the progress in human genetics over, over the last years. There's no question. So one of the questions that's coming in, and I have a few of my own, if we, uh, we'll see how things go, um, but what was the most unexpected genetic finding from your career? Oh, what a good question. Gosh. Hmm, tough one, um, isn't it? <laughs> well, hmm. There have been several. I think each time something works really well, <laughs> I think I think of that as the most unexpected. So in the case of the breast cancer story, the fact that that the result of which I was completely confident by the time I went public with it, uh, the fact that the result had such such wide implications that 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 it explained so many families with inherited predisposition to breast and ovarian cancer and was generalizable beyond BRCA1 to a whole a collection of genes, each of which is involved in homologous recombination DNA repair. That was absolutely unexpected. I, I, I had confidence in my result, but I thought the result would be small. But instead, it was, it was very, very large. I think the... Uh, at the other end of the technological spectrum in many ways, I think it's that we can identify for young people with a whole variety of these conditions, the exact genetic cause. Mm -hmm. And if we're fortunate, there will be a treatment tied to that cause. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we have to, we have to work on the treatments to tied to the cause. It took 20 years after BRCA1 and BRCA2 were cloned until there was a treatment for BRCA1 and BRCA2 null cancers based on those genotypes. Um, and, and it will take that, it will certainly take that for severe mental illness. Yes, indeed. So the next question was, what inspired you to work in genetics in the first place? Right. Um, when I was a new graduate student at Berkeley, I had gone to Berkeley to study statistics. And my advisor there, Dr. Jacob Yerushalmi, um, said, you know, I think you should take Kurt Stern's genetics course. He's going to be retiring after this year. This is the last opportunity you'll have to take it. And he's just magical. And I had had no biology. And I took Dr. Stern's genetics course. I followed Dr. Yerushalmi's advice. Dr. Stern and Dr. Yerushalmi were best friends. I followed Dr. Yerushalmi's advice, took Dr. Stern's course, fell in love with genetics, um, have never looked back. I, asked, I said to Dr. Stern at the end of the class, I just can't believe people are paid to do this. And he said, well, not a lot, but enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him if I could transfer to genetics and he helped me do it. And that was, that was the story. 
<laughs> so yes, it was just it just clicked with you, right? It, was it the just most, clicked. Right. I, and as, as you and I said to each other in our conversation this yes, morning, yes. if once you find something that clicks, it's, go for it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So and you obviously yeah, it's carried throughout your career. Um, another interesting question, that, which sort of came up from some of your uh, you know. Um, vignettes you have sort of lab-based vignettes but you're obviously very much involved with the patients with the populations you like to go out into the areas where these where the you know the, where the patients are you're in Palestine you're in Vietnam you're in Africa um, what why do you find the difference between working in the lab and working with uh, directly with your participants or do you, you like to do both and bring them together yes it, it, to me the the essence of doing genetics is is to bring them together. I I absolutely believe that it, with the modern tools that we have now, human genetics is best done for a population by people from that population, because people from from any population know best the social context of of the the conditions that we are studying. They know the interactions of environment with genetics. They know the historic demography of the population. And to the extent that I can learn that from our partners and I can bring students from the universities with which we, we a partner back to Seattle for, for you know, just orientation, introduction to modern tools and then send them back out, um, it, it, greatly, it greatly strengthens the project. And of course, it's enormous fun. Yeah, yeah indeed. <laughs> So that maybe that's, oh, I've got several questions coming up now, but I'll flip, flip because it follows up from your uh, statement about enormous fun, because one of the other questions was, when experiencing challenges and frustrations with your research, what helps you get through it? Oh, my students and the advocates. Uh, the Breast Cancer Project was very, very long before we had promising results. It was 17 years before we had a clue that we were on the right track. And I don't think I could have done that if it hadn't been for the women from these families, um, their, their widowers after they died, their adult children, who just, they were so encouraging. My, my colleagues who were the surgeons and the oncologists of these patients were so encouraging. It's, it's, it's just been fabulous. This is a very social field, genetics. And to be able to work in lab with young people who have fabulous ideas. And, and of course they have ideas beyond anything I would have because they, they think in terms of their education, not in terms of my education two generations ago. Uh, and with the advocates, that, that tri triad of, of my own thinking, advocates and students and postdocs is just unbeatable. Yeah. So the next question is, is a tough one. Um, would your schizophrenia study point to clinical approaches for prevention or therapy? Yeah, um, I think the answer is yes. Now, we, we very quickly move beyond what I know as a geneticist into the kind of thing that you know as a developmental biologist. But, but even from what we know so far in terms of the functions of these genes, these are not genes selected at random in the human genome that that carry these devastating mutations. These are genes that converge on a quite limited number of pathways. And if we can dissect where in those pathways there are pressure points that we can, um, where, where an intervention with, with, a, with a drug can reverse the, the effect of the mutation, then we'll be, we'll be on the right on the right path. It will mean different medications for different people, but that's fine because we'll be in a position to carry out the genetic diagnosis just as, as we now do for, for many other conditions. So I, the challenge, of course, is as, as we're all very much aware, we know less about the brain than we do about epithelial cells. So, so because the brain is less accessible than epithelial cells. So to be able to carry out this kind of fundamental biology on the brain is absolutely essential. And what I'm hoping is that our work in genetics will converge with the developmental biology that's being carried out on the brain all along and that people will see those connections. Those people are not likely to include me. I don't know that area well enough. But there are plenty of people who understand the genetics that's been 
that's been um, successfully deployed and that of course are carrying out the developmental biology. I should say here that one feature, one reason that we didn't solve all the families is that I very strongly suspect that some of these lesions are epigenetic rather than genomic. And therefore they're not, they're present only in the brain. They're not present in the blood. So we don't see them in the blood. So another technological innovation that will be of great importance will be when there's a way of actually from cell-free DNA identifying epigenetic changes, that is changes to the DNA that are not inherited changes, but changes that alter methylation or post-translational modifications that may have been somatic events that lead to these effects. Right. I mean, I think, I mean, it, I think is, it is it's quite, it's quite amazing. amazing. Now I'm feeling no, quite, um, um, quite amazing. Schizophrenia uh, has uh, demonstrated it's really a developmental disease. And once you know it's a developmental disease, it changes the way you think about it. And I, I think the, the, the identification of the, the, the genes and mutations is, is really going to change a yes. lot of thinking about schizophrenia in the next few years, for sure. Then the, the next question is about um, uh, genes where, uh, you know, they have multifunctional pleiotropy. So you have a, a gene where a mutation can cause multiple phenotypes, making it more difficult to necessarily link genotype to phenotype. So how, how do you deal with that kind of complexity? Right, right. right. Uh, tremendously interesting question. And it really, it, it really transcends all the vignettes that, that I explained. Um, we do that by asking our friends like Janet Rossent if they would be willing to develop a model organism that carries the mutation in our human family and to explore for us the phenotypes that are present. Uh, because families, even two uh, siblings with the same mutation, may present with quite different phenotypes, as the questioner notes. And so the way to dissect that, the way to explore that, is to develop uh, a mouse that has the human mutation and to explore what the range of phenotypes are and under what conditions various various organ systems might be affected. Yeah, and also not just mice, mouse models, but um, you know, human organoids are another way that these days one. Oh, can think from your lips to God's ear, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, but it is it is it adds adds complexity. So I think we're coming towards the end of a question, a more broader question. I mean, you focused on the importance of the current genome technologies, which have just changed everything. Um, as you said, I think when we were talking that, you know, you took all, what is it, 17 years and more to get to the BRC right. one gene. It's a, it would be a, um, a week's work for a graduate student these days. But uh, the, the fact is that genome technologies exist. Uh, and you've also demonstrated how important it is in, in populations, particularly children with rare diseases or under, undiagnosed disorders. And it's very clear that whole genome sequencing just opens up possibilities. So um, should we be sequencing every child when they're born and essentially giving everybody their genome sequence at birth? I don't see that as a high priority. Um, I think we should make whole genome sequencing available to every child for whom it's uh, for whom it becomes important in the context of health. Um, it will not be important for the vast majority of individuals. Um, it, it, it's still true that uh, exercising, having a good diet, and not smoking are the, are the best ways to prevent the, the late onset chronic conditions. I am also concerned about the specter of genetic determinism. And I'm concerned that if having a whole genome is somehow seen as determining the future of a child, that will um, tacitly uh, lead us to think less about what's absolutely critical for the full development of that child, which is way beyond what's in their, what's in their uh, sequence of DNA. So I'm not a great advocate. I'm not radically, I'm certainly not opposed to anybody who wants to get their whole genome sequence to do so. I haven't bothered to sequence my whole genome. Um, but I've certainly sequenced a lot of whole genomes, as, as you've heard. And I think that as it's called for, it should be freely available and good interpretive um, skills should be available to the family to sort it out. 
I think it's very important that you touch there on sort of the, the more complex, the environment gene interaction, which is, of course is, is, is fundamental to how, how we develop and how diseases develop. Um, if you were to look, everybody always asks this question, so I'm going to ask you, okay, 10 years in the future, where oh. do you see genetics going in the next decade? <laughs> Right. I'm hoping that we will really make big strides in the genetics of illnesses of the brain. Um, that will require that we be able to get at these epigenetic effects. And it may be that, that your comment about organoids is really critical here. Um, we're just, as you of course know better than I, we're, we're just beginning to be able to work with organoids and to manipulate them in ways we want and to introduce mutations the way we want, ways we want. Um, but so that we can see what the critical lesions are that can occur that are other than we can detect in, in blood. And when we can do that, we'll have windows into the brain that are beyond anything that that we can undertake currently. And when we have those windows and when we have a full profile of those lesions across these severe illnesses, we'll be in a position to, um, to, to make tremendous headway in their treatment. That, I think that's a great way to, to end the talk and to thank you very much, Mary Claire, for an excellent lecture answering the questions, quite complex, difficult ones. Uh, and obviously your overall contributions to genetics are truly inspirational. <laughs> so thank, you, thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you in conversation and then talk to you in person today and to sh for you to share your story with everyone. So thank you very much. Okay, and I would then just like to thank all of you, the audience, for joining us today. And I invite you to come back on Wednesday when we have a museum on the future of precision medicine, which is really going to focus on genetics, genomics, and epigenetics. And you'll hear more from Dr. King and other leading cancer scientists in that symposium. It's going to be a great day. Please uh, join us, follow us uh, around on social media, uh, check in on our sponsors, and uh, we look forward to seeing you for the rest of the week. Thank you.